safety's discussion is on the winter solstice. And please, next one. And we want to make the distinction here between the meteorological beginning of winter that starts December 1st and the astronomical beginning of winter that begins today. And the sun is directly overhead at high noon on the winter solstice at the Tropic of Capricorn as of today. I think here it may have the actual start of the, the actual moment of the solstice, I think it was five yeah, something. Four, four, it was four something, four thirty. But of course, the daylight yes, hours is. are shortest and the nighttime is the longest. Metaphorically and astronomically, we've reached the time of the greatest darkness. And now we begin to see the light ahead. And so it's a time of hope and promise. Next. And I want to begin by discussing, discussing this from a cultural perspective. The shortest day of the year represents a time of wonder and awe. It's a time of darkness in which we bring light into our lives that's been recognized at least since Neolithic times. As an observed astronomical event, it's a transcultural event. Many cultures signify it by the lighting of lights. Because it is so elemental to humanity, it's been codified into religion and secular rituals. When we look at the ancient observances, we immediately think of the Mayans, well, at least I immediately think of the Mayans, oh, who to this, note, this noteworthy day was a time of, to contemplate the blessings that were sure to come as spring arrived. And the winter solstice symbolized the renewal of life that was celebrated because every successive day to come in the season would be longer than the last. John Mayer Jenkins, John Major Jenkins, I should say, commented that the winter solstice meant more than the birth of a new solar year. It meant the beginning of a great new cycle of time to the Mayans. The resetting of the great star clock of procession and perhaps an unprecedented shift in the nature of human consciousness and civilization. That was a quote from John Mayer Jenkins, who was, a, of course, an archaeologist. The Zoroastrians, the celebration of the winter solstice is a sacred rite. In the Zoroastrian sacred lore, the winter solstice, Yalda, symbolizes the defeat of darkness and gloom and the moment when all hope is faded. It is in this exact moment that the invincible sun, the energy of light, brilliance, triumphs over sorrow and sadness. And the ancient Roman Matheorists themselves were convinced that their religion, the religion of Saul Invictus, or the invincible sun, was founded by none other than the seer prophet of the ancient Indo-Europeans, Zarathustra. The Northwestern European peoples, this period was known as the Yule. The celebration commemorated the events of the waning year and honored the gods with a festival of songs, food, drinks, and sacrifice. But with the steady spread of Christianity throughout Europe, many pagan beliefs and celebrations Yule were stamped out. Today, hints of these ancient faiths and the rituals of the Vikings can be found in some of the most popular Christmas traditions. This is the story of Yule, the Viking winter festival that helped create the modern Christmas celebration. The early <coughs> mention of Yule is found in the work of the chronicler and prolific historian called St. Bede, an English monk who was instrumental in the spread of the Catholic Christianity in Northern England. And I might add that the tree that we have in the living room right now and that many have for Christmas is really a rem remnant of that Yule celebration. That was the, that's where that came from um, originally. Um, I don't remember any tales of Jesus uh, bringing a pine tree into the house. <laughs> well, he wasn't I, wrong, I could be wrong, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they love that. <laughs> Next, please. Of the modern major observances, the first I want to mention is Diwali, which occurs several about a month ago. And it's a festival of lights that celebrates the triumph of light over dark, of good over evil, and the blessing of victory, freedom, and enlightenment. And this is celebrated earlier than the solstice. And of course, Diwali, I'm speaking about the Hindu uh, celebration. Um, 
but it demonstrates the importance at this time of the year when the sun's light is fading. And one of the things that I, I think is really interesting about Diwali, it fits with all of these, all of these traditions that we see on the screen right now, Diwali, Christmas, Hanukkah, and Kwanzaa, all came from different places, but they all celebrate light. And so we, we think back to the, to the Europeans, the, the Druids and, and the people that came after that, we think about um, Stonehenge as an example, which was erected so that uh, during the solstice, the, the light would shine through one of the two of the pillars uh, that were erected. And so it's interesting how this is a, such a transcultural, that the, the bringing in of light during this period of time is such a transcultural event. And then we see also uh, pictured here um, Kwanzaa. And the name Kwanzaa is derived from the phrase Mutanda or Kwanzaa, which means the first fruits in Swahili. And each family celebrates Kwanzaa in its own way, but celebration often includes songs and dances, African drums, storytelling, poetry reading, and a large traditional meal. On each of the seven nights, the family gathers and a child lights one of the candles on the kanara, the candle holder. Then one of the seven principles is discussed. An African feast called a karamu is held on December 31st. And I can see where, in fact, Kwanzaa, which was actually a, a modern uh, interpretation of the celebration that would have been practiced in, in Africa, borrowed heavily, heavily from uh, many Jewish themes because uh, to many Africans, they see their lineage as being uh, descended from Ham, through, um, from Abraham, the, uh, one of Abraham's sons. Then we have Hanukkah, which is the festival of lights or the feast of the Maccabees. And we lit the candles just a few minutes ago. And it's a Jewish fe festival celebrated for eight days. And for those who don't know, the reason for the for the Hanukkah celebration is that um, when the second temple was being rededicated, they went in to light the one of the oil lamps. And the oil lamp, um, they lit the oil lamp, and they realized that they, which was supposed to be lit um, eternally, so it was never supposed to go out. However, they only had enough oil for one or two days. And they said, well, how is this going to, what's, what's going to happen? This, this is impossible. We can't do it eternally because it's going to take a certain amount of time, at least a week, to get more oil to, uh, to Jerusalem. And this was in Jerusalem. However, it was said that there was a miracle. And so that oil that lasted for, would theoretically last for one or two days, ended up lasting for eight days. Hence the miracle of the lights. Um, then Hanukkah reaffirms the ideals of Judaism and commemorates in particular the rededication of the Second Temple of Jerusalem by the lighting the candles on each day of the festival. Although not mentioned in the Hebrew Tanakh, the Bible, Hanukkah come, came to be widely celebrated and remains one of the most popular Jewish religious observances, especially in North America. Christmas. For the Feast of the Nativity is the annual festival commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ, observed primarily on December 25th as a religious and cultural celebration among millions of people around the world. You know, I know a lot of people who claim to be atheists, but they still have a Christmas tree. You know, so there's, there's an interesting interloper there, you know. Uh, and I can guarantee you that they will exchange lots of lots of gifts you know, during that time. Um, although the month and the date of Jesus' birth were unknown, the church in the early fourth century fixed the date as December 25th, and this corresponds to the date of the winter solstice on the Roman calendar. What should be clear from these examples is light, candle, ghee, oil, or electric, as well as feasts and specific foods are integral to the celebrations and observances. Next, please. So this evening's discussion is fairly fairly light because it's holiday time. The solstice in Buddhism. 
to my knowledge, there is no direct reference to the solace in Buddhist texts. Perhaps I'll ask Ijishima Sensei later if he knows of any, but I, I don't know of any. I've, I've looked and looked and I couldn't come up with any. And of course, he'll probably say, I didn't look in such and such, but there it is. However, in East Asian Buddhism, the synchrony of Buddhism, Taoism, and in Japan, Shinto, results in a separate celebration in different ways. There are the multiple ways that the solstice is observed in East Asian cultures. And But let's back up for a moment and explore the connection to Japan. Next, please. Culturally, this is an important time. The winter solstice is called Ichiyu Raifu, or Toji in Japanese, meaning the turning point from yin to yang Yin and Yang are the complementary principles of Taoist philosophies. It also means the day of return of spring, when winter is gone and spring comes. Also, from the Yin Yang paradigm, the masculine, the Yang, is now fully transformed to the feminine Yin. The equinox is the most Yin day of the year. And, excuse me, the solstice, I should say, is the most uh, Yin day of the year. So, then this, the summer solstice will be the most yang day of the year. So it's interesting that, and then the, the equinox is a transition from the masculine to the feminine, feminine to masculine, depending upon which equinox one, one looks at. From a more folk perspective, Yusa Opurar is the customary, is customary, and Opurar is the Japanese bathtub, and Yuzu is a, uh, a citrus that approximately like lemon, uh, many people may have had yuzu, you know, at a, at a Japanese restaurant um, mixed with. Now, I, I actually have a gin that has yuzu as one of the ingredients in it, so it's a very fun. It's a very good gin, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very popular. It's a very popular. Uh, but yuzu, uh, it's it's really interesting that just the quality of the yuzu and the okuro water. Remember, the Japanese hot bath. You might think of it as a hot tub. Is really very hot. We're talking about something uh, that would be around in Fahrenheit. It would be around 104 degrees, 105 degrees, something, something like that. <laughs> he laughs. <laughs> and and you you soak in there, and you can see there the bath is outside, uh, and the yuzu just adds this sort of gentle quality to the water. Uh, and it's really a, a wonderful custom. But it's all it's it's a custom in Japan to, to do that on the solstice with the user fruits. Next, please. What do the kids do with you in there? They they're just bathing. They're just. I you, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can tell you. I can tell you. Thinly veiled. Sitting, sitting in the hot bath, sitting in a hurar, sitting in an onsen for twenty minutes, for half an hour, for half a day, is one of the most magnificent things you can do with your time. Mm -hmm. I can guarantee you. Right. And for those who have done it, you can share that. Right. You can share that oh, opinion. Yeah. Uh, in Shinto. Um, in Japan, the Shinto legend of Amaterasu is celebrated at this time of the year. And Amaterasu, I'll, I'll tell the short version. Amaterasu hid herself in a cave after being deeply insulted and leaving the universe in the complete darkness and chaos. Amaterasu is the goddess that brought light to the universe. The other gods begged her to emerge, but it was only after the goddess of mirth, Amunoto Ozumi, hung a mirror on a tree and performed an erotic dance outside the cave that the laughter of the other gods made Amaterasu peep out of the cave with curiosity. And then as Amaterasu, or Ama as she's sometimes called, caught a glimpse of her reflection in the mirror and was so startled that the other gods were able to pull her out, convince her to return to the sky, thus returning the light in order to the world. Her return to the sky is celebrated on the winter solstice of the 21st of December. And the solstice is by custom the darkest day of the year, filling the environment with light as a means to ward off the darkness, bring hope for spring. The promise of days build radiance and a metaphor for a better life. And I, I was actually thinking about telling the entire um, myth of Amaterasu because it's really, a, to me, one of the more fascinating uh, Shinto uh, myths. And, and just to 
to give you an idea of how important Amaterasu is to Japanese culture, the Japanese throne, the imperial throne, is descended from Amaterasu. So it was supposedly the, the Jimu was the first emperor of Japan. Uh, when this actually occurred is, is in the Kojiki is, is stipulated to be many, many years ago, perhaps it would have been around 2000, 4000 um, BCE. Um, well, Jimu's great grandfather was one of the descendants of Amaterasu. So the imperial family is directly descended from Amaterasu. And during the, the coronation ceremony of the emperor in Japan, he goes to Issei and the um, shrine, the, the Shinto shrine at Issei is where Amaterasu resides. And the emperor, part of the coronation ceremony is to go into the shrine. Nobody is permitted in the shrine except Shinto priests, but the emperor goes into the shrine to spend the evening with Amaterasu uh, as part of his coronation. So the, the, that mythology is very important to the Japanese people. And when we, when we think about myths, next month I'm going to talk about the, the, the importance of myths as allegorical meaning. Um, but I think that combining who Amaterasu is um, in the mythological context and then seeing how that provides meaning to the people of Japan is really, really vital and important. So maybe, maybe next month when I'm talking about myth, I'll, I'll actually uh, recite the, the myth of Amaterasu. It's really, really fascinating. Next, please. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Stay there. Um, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> The other figure that we see during uh, the solstice is that of Amida Buddha. And Amida Buddha is the Buddha of immeasurable light and often celebrated at this time of year. But, and Amida is the um, prince of the um, Western paradise. Amida Buddha is the Buddha of, of, limited, of boundless light, one of the immeasurable and infinite qualities. He presides over the great Western paradise. When a disciple dies, it is believed that Amida descends from his paradise to lead the faithful back to the Pure Land. And he is the central deity to Japan's popular Pure Land uh, traditions. Amida is also a member of the Buddha family that oversees the winter solstice, shining his light onto us as optimism, brightness, and clarity. And if, if you will, bringing a sense of, it's a, there's a satorological context that often uh that's often there also that just when things seem the darkest that's exactly the moment in which amita will shine down upon us next please and what about the tendai buddhist institute well as we've already seen we have the solstice tree and we have the kanika menorah and the hondo is decorated with additional candles. And so this is the time of the year that we bring light into the into our lives. Conclusion, please. In conclusion, the winter solstice is a period that touches humanity. It's not specific to a particular religious observance, cultural or nat national affiliation, though there are various religious cultural and national celebrations that are associated with the solstice. It's a seasonal celebration that recognizes the dark days that occur in our lives and provides hope and promise of better days to come through the symbol of lights. And it's fitting that people around the world observe this astronomical event. It has the power to bring us together regardless of our religion or lack thereof, and it has the power of light to extinguish the darkness. Thank you. And now, uh, next next slide. Uh, you can't forget to see what I. This to me is really symbolic of of the solstice. Is the owl sitting in the tree in the middle of winter? That the sound of the owl um, at night is just so Love so it. fitting at this time of year. And I'm going to ask first Ichishima Sensei. Sensei, can you think of any references in? Um, Sutra that make that make a 
reference to the um, solstice? Do you know of any? Mm, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, Japan today, 22nd, uh, uh, that is uh, Toji, as you mentioned, uh, winter solstice. And uh, usually we use uh, yuzu on the ofuro, on the hot bus. We put in some that kind of tangerine like uh, yuzu. Uh, this is a very interesting season. And uh, also in maybe tea ceremony, they welcome uh, people using uh, chair calls and uh, uh, changing the summer and winter. So uh, winter uh, <coughs> um, comes with maybe yuzu, and at the same time, in the tea uh, ceremonial uh, cere <coughs> uh, people, they celebrate uh, uh, different from summertime chair calls or uh, Honey, I don't know how to say. But anyway, this is a very interesting season. Also very, what shall I say, busiest season for us uh, Buddhist priests to <laughs> welcome New Year. Yeah. And uh, so I just uh, sent uh, many, what shall I say, uh, uh, New Year's uh, ceremonies, things, because still uh, COVID-19, mm, influences and so we don't have we cannot uh, uh, get together at the hondo and instead we sent such a, a card, memorial card to every uh, houses uh, ofuda etc and the calendars so yeah. uh, this is very in a sense we call it the shihasu in japanese uh, priest uh, run away <laughs> runs very uh, busy busiest season. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you for joining us, Sensei, because I know this is a busy, is a busy yeah, season, yeah, especially, okay. especially next Wednesday, just before the new year, will be even busier. Mm. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Mm. So thank you. And thank now you. we're going to finish, we're going to stop the recording and ask if people have any questions or comments.